Hi guys, welcome back to my YouTube channel. So for today's video, I'm going to go ahead and share how I make flowcharts. And this is something that was requested to me multiple times. So I figured I'd go ahead and make the video today. So if this is something you're interested in, please keep watching. And please don't forget to like the video if you liked it, as well as subscribe for more content like this. Now let's get into it. So I'm going to go ahead and share three flow charts today with you guys. And you'll see a screenshot of them over here. So before I show you my first flow chart, I want to say that I use different colors in my flow charts so I can separate, for example, the pharmacology from the pathophysiology. Um, I like doing this because I can see visually the different subjects on one flow chart. And I find that most helpful for me. Of course, if you like doing it all in one color, definitely do it the way you prefer. But I like seeing visually the different subjects all in one flow chart. And you'll see that on the screenshot that I share of the flow chart. Okay, so to start off with, we're going to go ahead with the first flow chart, which will be on pulmonary arterial hypertension, or PAH. And as we know, pulmonary arterial hypertension can be um, most often idiopathic, but it can also be hereditary. And the hereditary cause is due to an inactivating mutation of the BMPR2 gene, which inhibits vascular smooth muscle proliferation. So then we go further down into pathophysiology. So one of the first things we'll see is vascular smooth muscle proliferation over time. And we'll also see medial hypertrophy as well as intimal hyperplasia, which then ultimately leads to intimal fibrosis. And then we get the classic formation of um, capillary tufts or the plexiform lesions. And you'll see I have plexiform lesions in red. Um, often when keywords come up like this, I like to put them in red so I pay more attention to them. And I remember the specific name, for example, plexiform lesions in this case. So then I go into a little bit of the physiology. Um, going to the side, we have thickening of the pulmonary artery, which will cause increased work on the right ventricle. And because you have this increased work that the right ventricle has to does due to the thickening pulmonary artery, um, I have two clinical signs that come up in green. So the two clinical signs that come up are a loud pulmonic component of S2. And the second thing we see on clinical signs and symptoms is a right ventricular heave as well as a left parasternal lift. Continuing on with the physiology, when you have increased work on the right ventricle, that often leads to increased volume in the right atrium because the right ventricle is having a hard time pumping blood into the pulmonary artery due to the fibrosis or the plexiform lesions that have formed over time. And because of this, we have a buildup of blood in the right ventricle, which then goes back to the right atrium. So over time, you will see an increased volume in the right atrium. And this increased volume of the right atrium will then lead to coronary sinus dilation, which then leads to decreased venous drainage of the heart. So now going back to the plexiform lesions, when we go further down, you'll see that I go a little bit more in detail on the substances and the receptors that are there as well. So going from plexiform lesions, we also see over time increased vasoconstrictors such as endothelin and decreased vasodilators such as NO and prostacyclins. Now this is really important because they can ask you which substances is increased and decreased in PAH over time. And then from there I go into the pharmacology. So pharmacology is often targeted at these substances. So the first one that we have is an endothelin receptor antagonist or a bosentan and that decreases pulmonary vascular resistance. The second we have is prostacyclin analogs, which directly vasodilates pulmonary and systemic arteries. And an example of that is iloprost. And then the last medication I have here are PDE5 inhibitors. So the PDE5 inhibitor will inhibit PDE5, which will then increase cyclic GMP and cause an increase in nitric oxide. So there'll be prolonged vasodilation due to the nitric oxide still being there. Now at the bottom, you'll see that I have a contraindication for this, which I believe is very important because they can ask this in many ways. 
And the contraindication is that you don't want to give this medication if the patient is already on nitrates or nitroglycerin because that'll cause an even more increase in vasodilation, which can then lead to severe hypotension. So you can see from this first flowchart that I like combining different subjects and making it into one flowchart. So we start off with how we usually see PAH, it's a, if it's idiopathic or hereditary and then going on with the pathophys and then going a little bit more into physiology, also the pharmacology that we would use, as well as the clinical signs and symptoms that we would see if a patient were to present with PAH. So this was the first one, now let's go on to the second one. Okay, the second flow chart is one on DeGeorge syndrome, and these immunodeficiencies are something I had to put a little bit more time into because there's so many things that play into each one. Um, DeGeorge is definitely one of the most important ones to know for step one, so that's why I decided to include this flowchart. And again, you'll see different colors in the flowchart because I bring in different subjects into one flowchart. So let's go ahead and start with DeGeorge syndrome. So the first thing to know for DeGeorge syndrome is that it's due to failure of the neural crest cells to migrate, and you'll also see a 22q11 microdeletion. One of the things that we see because the neural cells fail to migrate is that we'll often see conotruncal cardiac abnormalities. And some examples from that I have listed are Tetralogy of Fallot, Interrupted Aortic Arch, as well as Truncus Arteriosus. Now moving on further down, we have the third and fourth pharyngeal pouches are often absent. And because they're absent, we have parathyroid hypoplasia as well as thymic aplasia. Going more into the parathyroid hypoplasia, the first thing we'll see in labs is that there'll be low calcium, hypocalcemia, low PTH, and you'll also see an increase in phosphorus. So the first clinical symptom that you'd see is Schwastik sign. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly as well as Trousseau sign. Now, going to the thymic aplasia, the main thing we would see here is a T-cell deficiency. And because you have T-cell deficiency, you get recurrent viral, fungal, and protozoan infections. And because these patients have a thymic aplasia, if you were to take a chest x-ray, you would see an absence of a thymic shadow. And then going back to the third and fourth pharyngeal pouch, going to the left of that, would see that I put what you would see in the third and fourth pharyngeal pouches if they developed normally. So the third pharyngeal pouch, you would see the inferior parathyroids as well as the thymus, while the fourth pharyngeal pouch, you would see the superior parathyroids as well as the parafollicular C cells, where calcitonin comes from. And if you wanted to expand on this flowchart even more, you could go a little bit more in detail into what you would see in Tetralogy and Fallot and how that differs from, for example, Truncus Arteriosus. So as you can see, this the possibilities are endless. You could keep going and going and going and write as much information as you want. Now this third flowchart is actually one that my professor shared with my class. It's a flowchart to figuring out pedigree questions. Pedigrees is always something that I, again, had a little trouble with. So once I learned this flowchart and memorized it, I have never gotten a pedigree question wrong ever since. So this is definitely a flowchart to put into memory. So the first thing you wanna determine is if the affected mother passes it to all her offspring or if affected fathers pass it to none. And if it is a yes, then you know it's mitochondrial. If it's no, then we have to look a little further and see if it's vertical or horizontal. Horizontal meaning that they're skipped generations, whereas vertical means that it's in every generation. If it's vertical, then you want to further look to see if fathers pass it to all daughters and no sons. If that's a yes, then it's X-linked dominant. If it's no, then it's autosomal dominant. And if it's horizontal, you wanna look and see if it's primarily affected males in the pedigree. And if it's a yes, then it's X-linked recessive. If it's no, then it's autosomal recessive. This is a flowchart that's helped me a lot when it comes to answering pedigree questions. And it's one that I've memorized for my step one. So this was my little video on flowcharts. Again, there's many ways to do flowcharts. I like putting multiple subjects into one flowchart so I can see the whole picture. 
Um, I like including the pharmacology, I like including pathophys, I like including even normal physio, I like including pharmacology, as well as clinical signs and symptoms and labs you might see because that'll further help you understand and know what's going on. Again, there are many ways to do flow charts, but this is how I like doing them. And I hope you found this helpful and got some ideas for your own on how you might want to do flow charts. Also, I hope the flow charts were clear and you were able to read them. My handwriting isn't the best, but I rewrote these so that they're nice and neat. Again, thank you for watching and I'll see you in my next video.